Hi, this is Rachel, and today we're going to be covering Topic 2, ABA Principles. So when we talk about behavior analysis, we want to talk about what our focus is. There's a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication when we talk about ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, and the principles that underlie ABA. So first of all, let's talk about the characteristics of behavior analysis. Our focus is on the current environmental events that are maintaining a behavior, setting up the uh, situation for a particular behavior, and what is going on right now. We are less focused on what may have happened in the past, except as it relates to the current setting. So we may have a situation where the learner previously experienced um, a, a situation and uh, that played out, but now that behavior is continuing. And because we know that behavior only continues if it works for the individual, then we have to look at what is this learner um, needing from this behavior? What are they, how is this behavior helping them in this current moment so that we can help support that learner in a different way? So there's a couple of examples here. Um, uh, we want to focus on the current environmental events. So what happened before the behavior, clearly describing the behavior and what happened after the behavior. Um, what happened before a certain behavior, for example, as soon as I pulled out the materials for coloring, Jimmy started crying. What happened after, as soon as Jimmy started crying, his dad came into the room and began to comfort him. This is not a judgment. This is just a statement of the facts. These materials came out, Jimmy cried, dad came in to comfort him. Um, when we say that we're not focusing on the past, what we're saying is that we are not going to say and rely upon the way it happened one time way back when to determine how it's going to play out the rest of the time. Because again, individuals don't use behaviors that don't help them in some way. Individuals don't engage in a behavior that's not meeting their needs. So every behavior is meeting that learner's needs in some capacity. And we have to view it that way, not as a behavior that we might want to decrease or increase or how it affects anybody else, but as a behavior that is getting a need met for that learner. Um, that they, at this point, for whatever reason, don't have another alternative way to get that need met. So we're not gonna sit there and say, well, one time the toilet flushed and it echoed really loud and it surprised the kid and so now he doesn't flush the toilet anymore. That may have absolutely set up a, um, a response, like it, it, it's paired itself with, um, with an aversive event. But if we're looking at why the learner is not flushing the toilet in their own home when it's not loud and it's not a surprise, we have to look at what is occurring within that situation. How is the learner getting their needs met? So maybe they do have a memory of a time when it was scary. And so this is how they are um, reducing their own anxiety around that, maybe. Maybe it's also because the faster they go to the restroom and get out, the sooner they can go back to play. So they might skip flushing, they might skip washing their hands, or they might do a really quick job. Maybe something is distracting them within the routine, and so that piece gets skipped. Um, that's what we need to look at, is what is going on currently, not necessarily what happened initially, though that absolutely could um, have a strong pairing and have an effect, but little emphasis on the past. We also 
want to sort of reject those uh, underlying causes um, that are saying things like, well, they do this because they're rude, they're bad, they aren't smart. No. Um, we also can't get into the circular logic of saying, well, this learner behaves that way because they have autism when the diagnosis of autism is based upon the way they behave. So you see how that's a circle. Instead, again, we're going to look at behaviors as what need is this behavior meeting for this learner in this moment. There are some misconceptions about behavior analysis. Um, one is that behavior analysis relies on punishment. Um, our ethics code guides us to use positive reinforcement, um, to use reinforcement strategies, to change behavior in positive ways, um, to exhaust those efforts before we even consider a punishment as an alternative. So we should not be using punishment um, unless we have truly exhausted everything. And even then, those should be um, used with appropriate approval and oversight. That being said, our culture works off of a basis of a lot of punishment parents implement time out. Um, there used to be corporal punishment in our schools. Um, our uh, police officers and our laws are based around fines and penalties if you break the law. So there's a lot of punishment happening in the world. Our job is to actually change behavior without using those common punishment strategies that the world relies upon. Another misconception is that we are bribing people. Um, a bribe occurs when you try to convince someone to do something wrong or illegal by verbally offering them a reward. Instead, we are trying to set up natural contingencies whenever possible. And if we need to add that extra contingency in the meantime until they can access the natural contingencies, um, for the behaviors that get that learner's need met. If we are addressing the learner's needs, then the consequence will be that the learner's needs are met and that is the reinforcer. That is what the learner wants. So we don't need to bribe somebody to do something when it is what they need. Um, also, it's more of a behavioral contract. So when you finish this, then you can do that. And unless you believe that you are being bribed to go to work, so you work and you get your paycheck, then um, you know doing this and earning these things is not a bribe. It's a behavioral contract. Another misconception is that behavior analysis ruins intrinsic motivation. So I mentioned before, we want to look for those natural reinforcers, opportunities for the individual to contact what they need, what they want, so they are getting reinforced by their behaviors. Um, so we are focused on those natural rewards, the, the natural consequences that support everyone's behavior, which is why we do any of the things that we do. We may need to start with more immediate primary rewards reinforcers um, or um, things that are a little bit more chopped up in order for the learner to get reinforcement at smaller pieces while they learn how to put everything together and contact those natural reinforcers. Intrinsic motivation really just means that the person is motivated by stuff that's already happening, how they feel, whatever the natural consequence is for the result of their action. Extrinsic reinforcement would be things that we might be adding like playtime or breaks or tokens to trade in for certain toys or certain activities. We might have to do some of those in the beginning, but the goal should be as quickly as possible to fade those things out so that the learner is getting reinforced by the natural environment. 
Another misconception is that we are boiling people down to numbers. We are um, looking at people only as their deficits and that we're dehumanizing those people. Again, we shouldn't be doing that. Um, we should be striving to help individuals get their needs met, be parts of their community and focus on helping them to be strong advocates, um, strong self advocates. Um, we don't want to boil people down to numbers. Every single person that we interact with, that we serve, is a person, no matter what their skill level. And we need to respect them and we need to help them become the, uh, to become their self advocates and to help them participate in their families, their community. Another misconception is that behavior analysts only work um, with uh, kids with autism um, and uh, people with developmental disabilities. However, the science of behavior analysis has been used to help people of all ages on a wide variety of behaviors, including quitting smoking, losing weight, exercising, um, behavior analysis has been used in organizations to help increase uh, safety on the job, to increase the use of seat belts. Um, there's a lot that can be done um, applying the science of behavior analysis. It is not just limited to a certain um, population with a certain diagnosis. Um, that tends to be just where insurance funding is right now. And that piece may get a lot of um, headlines and a lot of attention, but the field, the science of behavior analysis is much bigger than that. So some characteristics of behavior and behavioral um, treatments. We believe, we know that all behavior happens for a reason. Behavior is lawful which means it can be predicted and controlled. Now controlled, uh, there could be a better term, but the idea is that um, if all of these things lined up, you could predict what somebody would do if you knew all of the antecedent variables. You also, if you changed those antecedent variables, you could change how that organism would respond. That does not mean that we are out to control people. Um, the goal, again, should be improving that individual's ability to self-advocate and to get their needs met. Um, so it's more about the individual figuring out how to control or exert control, self-advocate for themselves in their environment and how to change the environment to get their needs met. We know that behavior can be observed, defined, and recorded. Our focus is on the current environment. So we look at the antecedents, which are the things that occur before the behavior happens. Um, that does not just mean the one thing the teacher said or that someone um, did right before. It also means things that may have happened a little bit further out, but have an effect on how that's going to go. So if I'm kind of sick, then that's going to affect how the rest of my day plays out because I don't feel well. If I have a toothache, um, that's going to affect how I respond to a lot of things because um, it's affecting how uh, it, it's an antecedent to everything that comes along. Um, that also means that we do need to consider um, the way the individual is experiencing their environment. So what is their internal environment? What are those internal or private antecedents that the learner may have? If I get a sudden headache, you may not see that antecedent but that is clearly going to be an antecedent for me engaging in a variety of behaviors to try to get my need of removing pain um, taken care of. We also focus on the behaviors. We wanna clearly define the occurrences that can be observed and recorded. We'll talk more about that. And we focus on the consequences, meaning what happened after the behavior. Not 
necessarily how someone responded, though that could be what happened to the behavior, uh, following the behavior, but more specifically, how did the environment change so that we can have a better clue as to what need the learner had that this behavior is meeting. So again, the learner is meeting their needs using behaviors. We are all use our behaviors to meet our needs. So we need to identify what those consequences are, what's happening in the environment so that we can help identify what need is being met by using that particular behavior. In practice, we want to make sure that our intervention procedures and protocols are very clearly defined and described and that our interventions are taking place in the settings where the learner needs to use that skill. They might have to start in um, a more uh, quiet or a different type of a setting separate from that natural environment initially, but then we want to move it back to the place where they need to demonstrate those skills so that they are able to use it and contact that natural reinforcement as soon as possible. Also want to touch upon, and we will spend more time on this in the future, but why do we take data? Behavior analysis places a high priority on data because we are trying to objectively measure something that um, can be very heavily influenced by subjectivity. So we want to count things. We want to um, describe things step by step. We want to look at the small units of behavior so that we can be objective in trying to understand the situation and trying to then systematically change the environment to help the individual get their needs met. Behavior analysis um, also uses data to help us determine, does a problem even exist? Just because somebody says they're doing this or I want you to work on this, does not mean that we need to. I have been in classrooms where learner A has been referred because they engage in disruption and they're not engaged in the class activities. And we go and we watch and we take data on how that learner is participating in class and also how their peers are participating in class. And we determine if there even needs to be an intervention. In some cases, that learner was no more disruptive, no less engaged than any of their peers. So at that point, we have objective data that show this, the problem is not in the learner's behavior. The problem is in the perception from that teacher that referred that individual. And so if we need to change anyone's behavior, we need to be looking at the teacher and the classroom environment, not that individual. Um, by taking data, we also can determine is treatment necessary. Again, do we need to intervene? Just because someone referred us does not mean that we have to intervene on what that, what that referral was for. Um, Data also helps us determine which treatment should be used, what um, uh, supports should be used. Uh, this is how we determine what's best practice. We measure the outcome so that we know what is um, the best choice for an individual. Data also helps us determine if the treatment is working. Um, we don't want to rely upon our opinion of if it worked or not. There are things like the placebo effect that could affect how someone is um, interpreting that data. Also, if I'm having a bad day, I might rate that this individual was more disruptive than if I'm having a good day, their behavior is less disruptive to me. Um, that's subjective. We don't want that subjective bias. We want to determine whether or not the treatment is working. So then the assignments would be reading Bear, Wolf, and Risley, 1968 and 1970, uh, 1987 articles, 
discuss um, what ABA considers when we're determining the cause of behavior, identify the dimensions of ABA as outlined by Bear, Wolf, and Risley, and describe each dimension of ABA and provide an example within your experience. And there are the references for that. So when we talk about the dimensions of ABA, um, that I think will be a whole other topic, but um, there's a lot of resources online and going back to these articles can really help clarify things instead of relying upon, um, you know, Pinterest, cute little uh, pins and acronyms. So uh, we will continue this series uh, moving through our supervision curriculum topics. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.